Christ of Family Reunion. John first ministered, Reverend John, sorry, Pastor John, first ministered in this church in 1990 before he met Jeffy. And then I remember a couple years later, he told Gordon, I think I'm going to marry a little girl over there. And Gordon came and told me, and I was all excited. And so we've known them forever. And I've never known him to be anything other than a mega blessing. So I'm yeah. here, glad you're here today. I can't tell you how much your friendship means. We just look forward to your coming so much. And right now we will dismiss the children quietly. Take one minute to stretch and say hi to somebody. And then I'm going to turn this right over to you. Praise the Lord. Well, I am so honored to be with all of you today. It's, uh, it is a mega blessing to be here with you. And uh, thank you so much. for. Uh, I want to thank uh, Pastor Denise for having us and her wonderful family. And a thank you for the hospitality and the kindness which we always receive in abundance when we come here. It's truly a blessing to be here. And uh, the church supports our ministry in Northeast India. We've lived there uh, more than 21 years. And we're very grateful for that. We're very extremely grateful for that. Apart from that, it would be very difficult for us to continue. I'm not sure what would happen. And uh, so we, we just want to thank you. We, if nothing else, we came here to let you know that we are... Uh, thanking God for you. We, we consider it a tremendous blessing uh, and we are eternally grateful. We have a short little clip we want to show you just to give you a little update. It only lasts two minutes, so by the time I sit down, it's going to be over. I'm going to come right back up. And it, it's got some music. If you if From the sound booth, if you can make sure you show this from the very beginning, make sure the sound is on, and maybe this will give you a little snapshot of what's happening. Here we go. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Once again, thank you. And great things are happening in Nagaland. Great things are happening in India. I'm telling you, wonderful, wonderful things. Praise the Lord. Uh, I want to ask you to open your Bible with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And we'll read from verse 5 and 6. And as you're turning, we're going to have a little word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, especially this Sunday morning for America. We thank you for this nation. We believe that your hand of grace is upon this country. We praise you, Father God, for the wisdom that you gave to the founders of this nation. That they were Christ-centered and God-fearing men who first dedicated this land for the glory of Christ. And Father God, we pray over this nation today. We pray that you would have mercy upon this land. We pray, Father God, that righteousness may prevail within this country. We pray for those in leadership that they would be protected and guided by your hand. We pray, Father God, that the cause of righteousness and the gospel of Christ may have free reign within this country as it should be. That in no school, that in no public arena, no believer would be forbidden to speak boldly and declare his faith in Christ. We pray, Father God, that there may be revival in America. We pray, Father God, that there may be awakening in our generation. We pray, Father, that the church may arise to her place of purity and power. We pray, Father God, that believers may no longer be conflicted, but fully dedicated and consecrated for the glory of Christ. We pray that it may begin even now as we are just a short distance from the capital of this nation. We pray that there may be an awakening, a revival, a change, a transformation in the land. Yes, Father God, we unite our hearts together in prayer with thanksgiving unto you. And we thank you for the freedoms we do have here today. We thank you, Father God, for this church. We thank you for the beautiful, wonderful believers who have gathered together in your name. We pray that you would bless us. I pray, Father, you would open the hearts of the people to receive and to respond to the Word of God the way you opened the heart of Lydia to respond to Paul the Apostle. We pray, Father, that he that speaks may speak as the oracles of God and may he that minister do so with the ability that you furnish so that in all things Jesus Christ may be glorified. To him belong the honor and the power the dominion forever. In Jesus' name. Can someone shout amen? amen? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So I want you to notice with me in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm going to read what may be a familiar passage of scripture for some of us. Verse 5 and 6, Hebrews 11, beginning with verse 5. It says, By faith Enoch was taken up, 
so that he did not see death and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Praise the Lord. Now before Enoch was translated, it is recorded that he pleased God. But if you read from Genesis chapter 5, the passage of scripture from which these verses, these verses are referring to, Genesis 5 doesn't specifically say that Enoch pleased God. Rather, Genesis chapter 5, verse 22, and again in verse 24, it does say Enoch walked with God. So why does Hebrews 11, 5 say that he pleased God when actually it doesn't say that? In the first century A.D., Greek was the lingua franca, the, the common language that most people understood. And most Christians in the first century A.D., when Hebrews was written, they read a Greek translation of the Old Testament, which we call the Septuagint. So the Septuagint in Genesis 5.24 says, And Enoch was well pleasing to God. Which is no contradiction, because you cannot walk with God unless you are well pleasing to Him. However, I think we could easily paraphrase Hebrews 11.6 this way. And without faith, it is impossible to walk with God. I want to talk to you this morning about walking with God. We tend to think of faith as something that we only need to have our prayers answered, our needs met. Many times it boils down to health and wealth. But actually... This verse indicates that we should be using our faith primarily to walk with God. The book of Hebrews teaches us faith by precept and example. Verse 1 is the precept. The rest of the chapter is the example. The first example he gives concerning us is Abel who offered a more excellent sacrifice to God by faith. That suggests worship. And the second example is this one, a man who walked with God, fellowship with God by faith. Are you out there today? In fact, if you go back a few verses to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38, it says, but my righteous one shall live by faith. Right? So faith is not something we need only on Sunday morning or in an emergency. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, faith is something to live by, but life is more than sickness and poverty or healing and prosperity. Life is more than just overcoming problems. Some people, when they say, well, I haven't used my faith, I don't have any problems. Yet we're called to live by faith. Right. Because we need faith to walk with God. Amen. Are you listening to me? In Genesis chapter 5, this, this whole passage lists generations of men over a long period of time just living and dying, the generations of Adam. But in this lengthy catalog of people is one man with a distinction. It says, and Enoch walked with God. So let that encourage you today. Even if everybody around you is just living and dying, you can walk with God. You can be distinct. You can be different. You can have the presence of God in your life, even if you're the only one. Amen. Can I get a better amen than that, please? Amen. Come on. Amen. Now, what will they say of you after you're gone? How will they write your obituary? What will you be remembered for? 
Will they simply say, well, he, he had a good job, he paid his taxes, he was a nice guy. He had a nice pickup truck. <laughs> One time he caught a bass this big. I mean, what, what are they going to say? It is my prayer for you this morning that after you are gone, future generations will remember you as a man or woman who walked with God. Yeah. Because I'm telling you, all that other stuff ain't going to matter in a short while. When you get to heaven, I'm telling you, nobody cares what kind of pickup truck you have. Are you here today? He walked with God. Now, I'm sure you understand this, that the word walk is a figure of speech. It's not just talking about this man taking a leisurely stroll through the park in the afternoon. It means his daily life, the way he lived, his lifestyle. The Genesis 5.24 in the Amplified Bible says this, that Enoch was in habitual fellowship with God. Habitual fellowship with God. A lot of people have habits. Here's a good one. The voice translation says this. Another translation says, But Enoch had such a close and intimate relationship with God that one day he just vanished. God took him. Usually in the church people just vanish. It's not because God took them. The Living Bible says he lived in constant touch with God. Ooh. Are you in touch today? Hmm. Sometimes it seems like you've lost God's phone number. <laughs> you've unfriended Him from your Facebook page. Another translation says He lived communing with God. So the idea is this. Enoch had more than good doctrine or accurate theology. That, that's fine. But he had something more than that. He had personal experience. There's a lot of people in the body of Christ today who can spout off all kinds of scripture verses and, 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 and theology and doctrine, but if you look at their life, it's basically a mess. It's not how much you know, it's how much you show. Are you here today? Enoch had more than something theoretical. He had something actual. He had reality. Are you walking with God? It's real quiet in this Presbyterian church. Are you still here today? I said, are you walking with God? Yes. Come on, when you're silent, you really look guilty. I have to tell you that. You really look guilty. How did walking with God affect his life? Did it make any difference? Oh, yeah. Even though the Bible only gives us a, sh a few... Uh, uh, glimpses into his life, we can see it, it made a big difference. One thing about it, Enoch had revelation. The Lord showed him things that otherwise he could never know. And this is all because he lived close to God. He lived in communion with God. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 20, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. Right, So you show me who your friends are, you show me the books you read, and I'll tell you who you are. Right? Well, whoever walks with the wise grows wise. Would that also include God? That if you walk with Him, you would become wise? He's a wise God, isn't He? Amen? Then again, the Bible says in Proverbs 3.32, But the upright are in His confidence. In other words, he confides with the righteous. In other words, you might say, let me confide in you. Let me tell you honestly what I'm not just sharing publicly. Wow. His secret is with those who fear Him. Ooh, that means God will tell you things that others don't know because you live in His presence. How do I know that Enoch had this experience? Because... Next to last book of the Bible is the book of Jude. It's only one chapter. And in verse 14, Jude refers to Enoch. And he says, Enoch, who was the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, 
Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of His holy ones, or His saints, to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds, etc. In other words, Enoch, who was the seventh son from, from Adam, seventh generation from Adam, predicted the second coming of Christ. He saw the end from the beginning, from the dawn of human history. He saw all the way to the end, something that still has not yet happened. How did he know that? Because God showed him. Because God showed him. Think about this. Enoch had a son named Methuselah. Genesis 5 tells us. He lived longer than any other human being. 969 years. That's a long time. Some of you think you're 70. You're way past your mind. This guy lived 969 years. He's still a teenager in his eyes. Right. <laughs> Methuselah's name in Hebrew literally means when he dies, a flood comes. And if you chart it out, when the very year Methuselah, the son of Enoch, died, is the year that Noah entered into the ark. How did he know that? God showed it to him. God showed it to him. The Bible says in the New Testament, in John 16, 13, concerning the Holy Spirit, when He comes, and He has come, He will show you he will reveal to you. He will declare to you things to come. Now I think that means more than just end time events in the church. I mean that's, that's, that's true I'm sure. But I think that also means the Holy Spirit can show you future events in your life. I'm not suggesting He's going to show you everything. Because you don't need to know everything. Some things it's better that you don't know. Because if you know you, you, you might want to quit right now. <laughs> but he'll show you what you need to know hmm? um, if it seems like life is always catching you off guard and every time you turn around you say man I didn't see that coming then you're not walking with God as much as you should he said he will show you things to come if you believe Him, He'll show you what you need to know. You'll be prepared. Are you out there today? Yes. So in many ways, Enoch is a type, or what I mean is like a picture of the church. His name in Hebrew means dedicated. Dedicated. If you want to enjoy close fellowship with the Lord, you're going to have to be dedicated. Some people, of course, they're not here this Sunday, but some people are fully dedicated to their hobbies, their career, uh, 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 fishing, hunting, cooking, sewing, whatever. A, a whole lengthy catalog of things, but hardly dedicated to the things that matter most. <coughs> come on, come on, Christianity is not something we do for two hours on Sunday morning. It's this life we live. Yeah. And with the things of God, it's all or nothing. God will never take second place in your life. He must be first. Or otherwise, just forget it. He's a jealous God. Right? And there's a godly jealousy. Right? You know, if I see my wife being real, real super friendly with some guy in this church, you know, my radar comes on. <laughs> on here. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? If she's spending, you know, every other weekend at, at, at Sam's house or Bill's house or Bob's house, you know, Sam, Bill, you know, and Bob are not going to live very long. <laughs> you need to buy some life insurance. <laughs> right? Because, you know, that's, is that, is that a sinful carnal thing? No, I think that's probably just a normal healthy thing. <laughs> right? God's a jealous God. Yeah. He don't want to share you with the devil. Well, I've enjoyed visiting you through this morning, Lord, and going back to the devil's house, I'll see you next Sunday. That's not going to work. That's not going to work. 
Hallelujah. Thank you for your enthusiasm. It's real quiet today. Hallelujah. Amen. Enoch lived for 365 years. Is it just a coincidence or is there a subtle hint here that you and I can walk with God every day of the 365 days? Not just on Easter and Mother's Day. <laughs> every day. Oh, I could preach a sermon right now. Hallelujah. I could preach another sermon right now. Hallelujah. And of course, Enoch didn't die. He was taken up. Just body and all, just taken up. Which is a type or a picture of the rapture, the catching away of the church. And God took him before the flood, which obviously is a type of judgment, divine judgment on the earth. Well, we are the Enoch generation. We must walk with God because the time is short. The Bible says in Romans 5, 9, much more shall we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. Amen. Now make no mistake about it. We are living at the end of the age of grace. And the next age is not called grace. It's called tribulation. It's yeah. called wrath. Yeah. It's a time of divine judgment on the earth. On. Now, go back with me to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. I'm talking about walking with God. Notice again, it says in, the, in verse 6, For he who comes to God must believe. He who comes to God must believe. The Greek word for come, New Testament was originally written in Greek. The Greek word for come is probably pronounced proserkomai, something like that, proserkomai. Literally means to come forward. It means to approach, to draw near. It also means to worship. So in other words, if we want to fellowship with God, if we want to experience intimacy with God, we can't just wait for Him to come forward because He's waiting for you to come forward. Right. Amen. 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 Amen? And what that means is we must have a prayer life. What is worship if it's not prayer? What is worship if it's not prayer? It's not music. It's not just a song. It's prayer. Some people love music more than they love Jesus. Musicians love music. Worshippers love God. I'm not opposed to music. I'm a music major myself. I, I appreciate music. I appreciate your wonderful praise and worship team. But actually, worship is what happens when the song is over. Yeah. Yes. Always tell our worship team, if you finish your song, or if you stop in the middle of the song, and you just hear crickets chirping, that's called concert. <laughs> worship is us expressing Amen. to God Amen. our love and adoration for Him. Amen. The Bible says God inhabits the praises of His people, not the blank stares of His people. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, any relationship must have a constant flow of communication. And that includes our relationship with God. God wants you to open your mouth and say something to Him. There is no communion without communication. Right? I mean, once again, back to my husband and wife analogy... You know, uh, many wives, you know, are desperate for a conversation, meaningful conversations with their husbands. Like the woman, you know, like the man that answered the phone and said, well, you have the wrong number, but my wife will be happy to talk with you. <laughs> right? God longs for your communication because He wants to walk with you. In James 5.16, James 5.16, in the New King James Version... It says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much or can accomplish much. One time I asked the Lord, what is sexual fervent prayer? What is that? And what I heard inside me is the Lord said, a believing prayer. A believing prayer. 
In other words, when you speak to him, you need to believe there's someone on the other end of this who says, I hear you. Yeah. I'm listening to you. Wow. Do not misinterpret the silences of God. Just because you don't hear him say anything, that doesn't mean he's not listening. Many times my wife says something to me and I, I may not say anything, but I don't mean I didn't hear, I heard. <laughs> Definitely that's true concerning her. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Again, in Jeremiah 33, verse 3, it says, call to me and what will I do? I will answer you and will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Prayer is not a monologue. It's not you reciting pretty poetry with your eyes closed. One time I was telling the Lord all about the things I was going through. And he, said, he stopped me and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm praying. He said, no, you're not. You're complaining. <laughs> That's not prayer. The hot prayer should be a dialogue. Um, I went to Bible school uh, a few years ago, and I, I remember uh, I was in one of our classes, and uh, this was like in 1987, and uh, it was a couple of years ago, I guess, and um, it seems like a couple of years ago, <laughs> and um, Brother Hagen came out to the platform, this auditorium full of people, I mean, there's probably, I don't know, uh, 400 students, I suppose, I and he came up to, to start his class, you know, teach his lesson. And as he prayed, he kind of got a little bit tongue-tied or something like that. And then he, 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 he seemed like he was interrupted. And so he, he kind of paused for a second. He said a few words in tongues or something. And then he said, all right, Lord, yes, I know that. Okay, thank you. And then he went back, you know, to his lesson or whatever. And he kind of got like seemingly interrupted again. And he, he, he said, yes, Lord, I, okay, yes, I know that. Thank you, Lord. And then it happened like two, three times. And then... He started to pace back and forth on the platform, you know, like this. And he was talking. All right, yes, okay, uh-huh. And I, you could, you know, he's, I could, we could all see him, we could hear him. And I, I mean, as I'm sitting there watching him pace back and forth, for just a moment, it's like I could almost see someone walking with him. And then he came back to the pulpit and said, all right, let's open our Bibles. And we're all like, wait, wait a minute. What, what was that? What, what just happened? And he, he kind of noticed that and he said, oh, uh, you know, don't worry about that. That's, that's none of your business. <laughs> As if that's just an ordinary thing with him. Like, you know, like we might burp or something. <laughs> He's walking with God. He's walking with God. So there's many people that can preach what Brother Hagin preached. But they don't have the experience that Brother Hagin experienced. Come on. Hallelujah. I'm trying to come on. <laughs> <laughs> many years ago, many years ago, uh, uh, say maybe 19, it was 1985. It was the summer of 1985. It was August of 1985. And I, in the church that I was attending in those days, uh, they offered a class on gifts of the Spirit, and so I, uh, you know, I signed up, I attended it. They met you know, on a weekday, I don't remember which day, Tuesday, I think, in the afternoons, evenings. And uh, it's actually a really great class. There was a little woman there that was from Holland that taught the class, and she did a good job. And, and then, you know, she taught a little bit, and then we, you know, we would pray, and, 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 and people, you know, they had a manifestation of the Spirit. I mean, they had, some of them had visions. They, uh, in fact, uh, uh, one young fellow there, he said to me, you know, when I prayed for you, I saw you wearing like a, a suit and you had a, a briefcase in your hand and you were walking down a hallway and it's like you had some kind of authority or something. At the time he said that, I'm wearing blue jeans and a t-shirt and no one would describe me in that way. Wow. That's how I am now. <laughs> And then he said, are you going to go to Bible school or something like that? He didn't know. I was already enrolled in the next month I was going to be leaving. There's no way he could know that. And I mean, and many good things like that. But it bothered me because I had nothing. I mean, I got nothing. No word, no revelation, no nothing. Just nothing. 
You know, and it really bothered me because I know that many of these people who are in this class, they haven't been a Christian as long as I have, and they don't know as much as I have. How come they have all these things happen, and I got zilch, I got zero, nada. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm starting to get like a, a complex about this. Here we go again, you know, Brother Zama Zama and Sister Doohickey, and then we come to Brother John, nothing, let's move on. And I'm like really getting, you know, concerned about this now. I'm really getting bothered by this. So I went home, you know, and I sat to pray. I mean, I started to pray extra. You know, I'm praying up a storm here because I want to hear God's voice. And I'm telling you, I want to hear your voice. And I prayed and prayed. Next week, same thing, you know, to repeat, ditto. Then, you know, I went to praying more. And I'm praying, and I'm praying in tongues. I'm, and now I'm in my, on my knees praying because I said, God, I want to hear your voice. I want to hear your voice. And just nothing. Same week, third week, same thing. And I remember... I was kneeling by the bed in my room and I was praying in the spirit. That means in, in my prayer language, an unknown tongue. And suddenly I heard a voice speak to me inside here. But it was so real, I almost flinched like maybe somebody near my shoulder was, 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 was saying this to me. And I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. This voice said, my son, you don't know how I long to hear your voice. never occurred to me that God wants to walk with me much more than I want to walk with Him. It never occurred to me. I never would imagine that the God of the universe would desire my companionship more than I would desire His. After all, He paid a terrible price so that you could fellowship with Him. <coughs> Hallelujah. Amen. No earthly father desires the company of his children more than God loves the companionship of his family. Amen. Are you listening to me? You know, a lot of times what happens when we're younger, when we're first married, we're so busy with paying the bills and just try to stay afloat, just keep your head above the water, that a lot of times you don't have a lot of time to spend with the kids. And then when the kids are older, they don't have a lot of time to spend with you. Like the poor old man that went to the cell phone company and said, said, I know there's something wrong with my phone. My grandkids never call. Well, God has a heart for you. He's your father. He desires to be with you. Come on, that, that ought to cure you of low self-esteem. He, and he knows everything about you. If we knew everything about you that God knows, we might not want to hang out with you. I'm not sure. <laughs> if we knew what you were thinking right now, we might really be offended. <laughs> but He knows your thoughts before you think them. And yet He loves you still. And wants to be with you. In fact, let's put it this way. To get out of the theological realm, which sometimes is stifled. God not only loves you, He likes you. Right. He likes you. You know, like I'm commanded to love my brother. The Bible says love your brother, love your enemy. It says love your neighbor. Because usually that's the same person. <laughs> right? You know, I have, to, I, have, I have to walk in love toward people. I don't have to like them. <laughs> but God likes you. He likes you. Hallelujah. Amen. John G. Lake was a powerful man of God. He, he, he lived uh, uh, around the turn of the, of, the, of the last century, 20th century. And uh, he went to South Africa in the uh, early 1900s and had a tremendous ministry there. Planted, I think 4,000 churches were planted under his ministry. And tremendous healings, amazing miracles that just shook that nation, shook the continent of Africa. In fact, uh, there's a, a volume, I believe it's pronounced mat Materia Medica. It's a, it's a large medical journal that's found almost in every medical school. And it lists John G. Lake as having an outstanding ministry of healing. It's amazing. It's even Mahatma Gandhi referred to John G. Lake. One day the whole world will accept his teachings. I mean, he was, he was, a, he was an amazing person. 
his daughter was a, her name was Gertrude Wright. His daughter said that my father had little conversations with God all day long. My father had little conversations with God all day long. She said whether we were seated at the table for dinner or, or sit in the sitting room or, or, or some other activity, there was like an invisible friend that he was always talking to. And she said that in, in later years, Lake began to lose his eyesight. Started to go blind. I don't know, cataracts or something like that. And so uh, her father literally took a little walk in the afternoon, literally. And as he was walking, he was talking with the Lord. And told the Lord he didn't think it was appropriate for a servant of the Lord to look, go blind. Especially one who had dedicated his life to ministering healing. She said, when my father came back from that walk, his eyesight was perfectly restored. He walked with God. He walked with God. The Bible says in James chapter 4 verse 8, draw near to God. He will draw near to you. James didn't write this verse to sinners in the world. He's writing it to you and me. To believers. That means you can come closer to God than you are right now. You might say, well, I'm born again, baptized Holy Spirit, you know, sanctified, dedicated, I'm a member of this church. And, but you can still come closer. Amen. Now this verse doesn't say, if you draw near to God, you'll just be closer to Him. It says, if you move toward Him, He will move toward you. Amen. You take one step, he will take two. Amen. Now people sometimes ask me, you know, uh, Brother John, I have this thought in my mind or this thought in my heart about doing this thing or going here, that sort of thing, and I'm not sure if it's God's will or not. And this is my advice. When I'm, when I'm driving my car across the state or maybe in the region, what have you, as I'm going through the radio dial, as I come closer to the radio tower, come closer to the signal, it becomes stronger. Yeah. And naturally, as I'm driving further away from it, that signal becomes weaker. It becomes broken up and staticky, right? Likewise, if there's a thought in your mind or in your heart about doing something, if you're contemplating a decision, maybe right now, get in God's presence. Yeah. Draw closer to Him. Don't just, don't just keep asking Him over and over again, is this your will? Is this your will? Is this your will? Do you want me to do this? Show me God. Show me. No, don't, don't worry about that right now. Just draw closer to Him. Maybe through worship. Just get in His presence. And if that thought that you're considering, that, 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 that thing becomes stronger in you, then that's probably from God because you're getting closer to the radio tower in heaven. Yeah. But if it seems to fade, or even when we're in church on Sunday morning or, or Sunday night or what have you, and that, that, that thing seems to just rise up within you, that may be an indication that's from God. But if it seems to just fade away and it's like, oh yeah, what about that? Then that may indicate that it's not from Him. That's just, that's just your own natural thinking. Right. I think many people make a terrible mistake. They make life-changing decisions when they're far from God. Right. You would understand. We talk about pride and arrogance. We think somebody that you know, walks, talks big, he's proud. Or somebody that's got kind of an attitude, he's really proud. <coughs> yeah, but the epitome of pride would be to think you can make it in this life without his help. Hey, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you may have a Bible under your arm and every kind of Jesus sticker on the back of your car. But if you think you can make it on your own, ah! How's that working out for you? God resists the proud. You need His help. I need His help. Amen? Can I get an amen? Come on. Back to Hebrews 11.6. Notice it says, He who comes to God must believe that He exists. One translation says that He is real. Somebody say, God is real. God is real. Hey, that's right. So God's not a concept. He's not an idea in somebody's head. He's not a, just a merely a doctrine. He's not just merely an influence or a power. He is a person. Right. Right. 
He is a person. And since he is a person, he has a personality. That means he has certain things he likes and certain things he does not like. Right? right? right. Now, the longer I'm married, the more I'm sure my wife has super hero powers, the original Wonder Woman, she can read my mind. I guess it's a gift. I'm not sure how the word that came from. She can read me like a book. Oh, yes. well, it's a we don't have time right now, sister. She knows me. She knows me. We've been, we've been together long enough. And, and, I, and I know what she likes and doesn't like too, to a certain extent. I mean, I can now order for her when the waitress, when she's in the restroom and the waitress comes, I say, and she'll have water with lemon. Because I know that's what she wants to drink, right? You know, right? The more time you spend with somebody, the more, you, the better you know them. Right? Well, I just don't understand the Lord. Well, that's because you're a stranger. He's not that hard to get to know, actually. The more time you spend with God, the more clearly you understand what He likes and doesn't like. And there's some things God does not like. Some things He likes. In fact, I, I would say, you, you don't even have to hear like a voice speak to you. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I just know sometimes you don't like this. I, I can feel it. You don't like this. Something's going on here and I just feel like inside. I know you don't like this. You don't like this. He's telling me you don't like this. That just like I look at my wife and she's got that look. She doesn't have to say anything. She don't like this. I got that look. I got that feeling. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So it shouldn't be hard to know his will, what he likes and doesn't like. It's just hard when you're a thousand miles away from the radio station. Yeah. Right. Amen. Or actually you're on another channel listening to something else. Mm -hmm. God is real. Amen. And if we will continually draw near to him with an unwavering confidence, the reality of God will be more evident in our life. When you wake up tomorrow morning, just say to yourself, God lives in you by His Spirit. Amen. As you walk down the, the sidewalk or, or get in your car, say, the Lord is with me right now. Amen. Lord, you're with me today. You're going to help me today. You're an ever-present help in time of trouble. Hallelujah. Yes. Glory to God. Then you become more conscious and more aware of His presence. Say, well, I don't really feel God's presence. Yeah, but, but if you ignore people, that's how it feels. Yes. How would it be if someone was sitting next to you in your car and you drove for an hour and a half and you didn't say a word to them? Uncomfortable. The person just feels unwelcome. Yeah. Smith Wigglesworth was another great man of God. Amen. And uh, I heard that he was a, a pastor, picked him up maybe at the train station or something and took him by vehicle to travel somewhere. And, and they had been driving for, for, for five or ten minutes talking about the weather and, I don't know, certain current events. And suddenly, Wigglesworth said, Stop the car! And this pastor came to a screeching halt and said, What is it? And Wigglesworth said, It's been more than five minutes. We haven't even talked about the Lord. <laughs> Actually, I thought about that on the way over to the church this morning. I was thinking about that. Um, they said, well, that's extreme. Yeah, but he, he raised 23 people from the dead. That's extreme, too. <laughs> Hallelujah. Again, Hebrews 11, 6, and he rewards those who seek him. Amen. You not only need to believe that God is real, you need to believe that you can communicate with him. Well, the message translation, I love this, says, and that He cares enough to respond to those who seek Him. Amen. He cares enough to respond to those who seek Him. Now there's some people that never return my calls. You know, you know people like that? Maybe that's you I'm talking about. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many messages I've left on their answer machine. They don't bother to call. There's some people that never reply to my emails. Never. But God 
cares enough yeah. to respond to those who seek Him. Amen. Woo! Hallelujah. Woo! Come on, that's good news. I said He cares yeah. enough to respond. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> you call Him up, He's going to say, I'm on the line. <laughs> Glory to God. Many translations say this. Actually, when it says He rewards those, and literally in Greek, He, he pays wages. It pays to walk with God. Right. It pays to seek Him. Many translations say diligently seek Him or earnestly seek Him. It takes some diligent effort on our part. We read earlier in Genesis 5.24, in the New International Version, it says, Enoch walked faithfully with God. Again, the Amplified Bible, habitual fellowship with God. If you read the story, the passage says Enoch walked with God for 300 years. Not just one Sunday morning. And a couple of Wednesday nights. He walked with God every day. Many Christians, and again, they're not here this morning, but many Christians have seasons in their life when they're closer to the Lord and then seasons when they're further away. If we could chart it on a, on a graph, it would look something like a roller coaster. Up and down. Some people would look like stalactites and st whatever it is. <laughs> Amen? If we want to experience fellowship with God, we need to be consistent. That means next Sunday you don't have to pray about whether you should come to church or not. You don't need to stand in the street with your moistened finger in the air to see which way the wind is blowing. It's real quiet in this church. Did I say something wrong, Pastor Denise? <laughs> Hallelujah. Why? Well, that's part of seeking God. Yeah. Why should I do that? It pays. Amen. It could save your life. God can give you revelation. God can give you wisdom. God can give you exactly what you need. Who knows? Maybe this sermon is just what you need. I don't know. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Even you might think, well, that message had nothing to do with me. This message... And future messages are not just for now. It's for tomorrow. Amen. You don't know what's coming your way. He does. Are you listening to me? Yes. Maybe one more scripture, then we'll have to let you go. In Amos 3.3, 3, in the New King James Version, Amos 3.3. 3, don't turn there. By the time you find it, I'll be having my lunch. It says, <laughs> it's in the Old Testament. <laughs> Can two walk together unless they are agreed? The New Living Translation is this. Can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? You cannot fellowship with God by constantly disagreeing with Him. Right. You cannot have intimacy with the Lord by constantly refuting what He has said in His Word. God is never going to tell you something that contradicts the Bible. So, well, I heard the Lord say this, but if it doesn't agree with the Scriptures, you heard from someone else. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, so many people, they're saying things like, well, Lord, where were you when I needed you? Okay, number one, that's not a question. That's an accusation. You're accusing Him of being unfaithful. Secondly, that does not agree with what He has said. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Even when you don't feel like it. He's still there. A friend of mine, and I've mentioned this before, but a friend of mine, uh, she came to Nagaland with her husband and, and, and she was telling me that uh, she's a singer. She and her husband sing and they sing very, very well. And, and she told me that she had this song that she sang, a special song number, and, and, and part of the lyrics said that, you know, you are you know, wonderful and marvelous and you are incredible. And she said when I would sing that song, every time I sang it, I had kind of a, like a little funny feeling inside, kind of an itchy little feeling. And she felt something funny about that. And she, and she asked, and the Lord said to her, look up that word incredible in the dictionary. Right. So she looked it up and it said, not credible, not believable. 
And then the Lord said to her, See, you're saying something about me that I never said about myself. See, if you want to walk with God, you need to agree with Him. Even when you read the Word of God, listen, the Bible is not a buffet table at Golden Corral where you just pick the parts you like and leave on the table the things you don't care for. It all goes together. Can't you just preach on the good parts? No, God doesn't just give you what you want to hear, but He will give you what you need to hear. It's all His Word. It's all true. Not just your pet doctrine. Not just your favorite verse. It's all true. Yes. There are some things in the Bible that you and I read and we kind of go... Mm. Amen. But what we need to say is, alright Lord, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. When God says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, you don't say, why? <laughs> you say, yeah, that's right. That's right. And when the Lord corrects us, when He speaks us, when He corrects us, and it could be from the pulpit, don't go, ha, who did He think He did? Come here, talk right No, you say, yes, Lord, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I received it. I received it. Yeah. You want God to talk to you, you better listen. Yeah. Many Christians have selective hearing. Again, they're not here today. Too bad. When you see them, tell them I said this. Many Christians have, some, just like my children, when my children were small, you know, they'd be out playing in the yard and you'd say, come in, do your homework. And it's like they're all deaf now. They can't hear that. I'm screaming my lungs out and they're just like, you know, they don't hear it. But they could be in the next room and I could whisper to my wife, let's go into town and get ice cream. And we can hear them say, I'm coming too, I'm coming too. <laughs> Many Christians have selective hearing. We say, God wants to bless you. Amen. God wants to prosper you. Hallelujah. God wants you to humble yourself. God wants you to forgive somebody. Many times we want to hear God when we got something, we got a problem, but we don't want to hear Him when He wants to talk to us about doing something. I think God speaks to us when it's time to give the offering and tithe. What should I give, Lord? Oh, give give a thousand dollars. Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> Can two walk together unless they are in agreement? You gotta learn to be God's yes man. His yes man. Whatever he says, say, yes, that's right. Yep. You're right. Yes. Oh, yeah. He said, well, you need to change this. And you don't go, ha! You said, yes, that's right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. If you disagree with God about anything, that means one of you is wrong. Just saying. Any guess who it is? <laughs> He's right. Yeah. Now, some people think it's real intelligent to kind of doubt everything. I don't know. Oh, you never know what God's going to do. I'm not so sure. That's not a sign of intelligence. That's a sign of ignorance. He's the most intelligent being in the universe. He has all wisdom, all knowledge, and he cannot lie. So if he says it, then that's the way it is. And some people spend all their you know, time trying to see if they can somehow twist the Bible to make it say what they want it to say. They find it easier to change the Bible than to let the Bible change them. Oh, wow. Burn. <laughs> well, you're, you're not going to walk with Him. You're going to have a very superficial yeah. fellowship with the Lord. Right. I don't want that. No. I don't want to be just another guy living and dying uh -huh. and going to church on 4th of July weekend. I want to know him better than that. Yeah. I want to know him better than that. Because it pays to walk with God. Can we stand up to our feet today? Praise the Lord. Can you lift your voice and can you give God some praise in this house today? Can you lift your voice and give God some praise in this house today? I want to open your mouth and give him the thanksgiving and the praise that he deserves today. Because he's worthy of our praise. He is the living God. It doesn't matter what your neighbor thinks about it. It's what the living God thinks about it. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy to be served. 
It is an honor to know Him and to walk with Him is the highest privilege any human being could ever have. Better than an invitation to the White House. Better than dinner with the Queen at Buckingham Palace. To know the God of this universe is the highest honor you could ever have. And you have a standing invitation at the throne room of God. So let us therefore come boldly. Let us therefore come boldly. Let us therefore come boldly. In full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled clean from a guilty conscience. Father, we want to walk with you more. We want to know you better. I believe in my heart. God wants us to come up to a higher level. Wants to come up to a higher level. You may be satisfied with your walk with Him. But I have a feeling that doesn't mean He's satisfied. He wants more. He wants more of you. He wants all of your heart. And not just a part. He wants more of you. God is calling us into intimacy with Him. Because there are things He'd like to share with you. There are certain gifts that will not be given just in a public setting, but in the secret place where you are alone. There are certain things God's not going to say just in general to everybody. Certain things He wants to say whispering just to your ear. And your ear shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. When you turn to the left hand, when you turn to the right hand. Intimacy. There are many heartaches that could be avoided if we had just heard from heaven. If we had just been a little bit more sensitive. Give Him the best of your years, young people. Amen. Not the leftovers. Amen. Don't say heaven can wait. Give Him the best hours of the day. Hallelujah. Not just a few scripture verses before you nod off to sleep at night. Because He desires your companionship. And life can be different for us. Can you just lift your hands one more time? Lift your hearts in one more time. And just thank Him and worship Him. You are real. You are real. There must be a distinction. There must be a distinction in this generation. It's not our, just our style. It's not just our appearance. It's His presence. There's a world out there that needs to see the Enoch's in this day. There's a world, a skeptical world out there that is tired of just colorful religion. They need reality. They need to see it. So Borodi. Lord, we repent. We repent from our stubbornness, from our pride. Turn away from sin. That which displeases you. You've called us to walk with you in holy places. You're drawing us near. You're calling us. If you want a closer walk with God, lift up one hand toward heaven with you. Say, Father God, Father God is my heart's desire, my heart's desire to, know to know you better, to walk with you, to walk with you in, intimacy, in intimacy, in fellowship. I want to hear your voice. I want to sense your presence. I want to be closer than I've ever been before. Turn away, Father. I turn away. All every distraction. I lay aside every weight and every sin. With all my heart, I want you. You know, if the Lord appeared to you tonight and said, What do you want? What would be your answer? That's the correct answer. But I hope it's also the honest answer. Amen. That's the best answer. I want more of you. 
Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the wonderful people that are here. Amen. Father, if there are believers here today who are maybe not where they should be or not where you want them to be, I pray that this message will draw them back, bring them back to that place they once knew. If there are those here who are like the prodigal son in the Bible, who wandered away seeking fame and fortune or other things and have fallen into sin or maybe their hearts have just grown cold toward you. Oh Lord, a loving Father awaits them to warmly greet them, to embrace them, take them into His bosom and restore them. Father God, You are so merciful it's all because of the blood of Jesus. Amen. It's all because of your unconditional Amen. love Amen. for us. And if there are some here today who are not even sure whether they're a child of God or not, not even sure if they know Jesus in reality or not, I pray, Father, you'll help them to receive Christ, to make a decision for Him, surrender their whole heart to Him. One day from now, it won't matter what kind of house you have. One day from now, it won't matter how much money you had in the bank or how many vacations you went on. One day from now, it won't matter at all. Yeah. The only thing that will matter is that you knew Him. Yeah. That you know Him. If you know Jesus as Lord, can you lift up your hand right now as a witness? Put your hand down. If you don't know Him or if you're not sure if you know Him, and you put your hand up. If you're not sure that you know the Lord, and you need prayer, just put your hand up and we'll can. Yes, God bless you. Are you raising your hand? Yeah, I am, because we all need to be closer to God. Yes, but are you saved? Are you born oh, again? Absolutely. Okay. If you're not closer. born again, if you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, can you raise your hand? Just checking right now. All right. Father, I speak a word of blessing over this church and over this congregation. Thank you today for this wonderful, wonderful family of faith. I thank you for the pastor, for those who are serving here faithfully. I pray you'll bless them in Jesus' name. Come on, lift up your voice one more time and give a shout of praise to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.